The reading is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 18. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 18, 1184 in the Church Bibles. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Titch, no, I've been practicing this word, sorry. <laughs> Titch, because I think there's something like that, will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and, fe and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who has come to you, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him if he comes to you. Welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Herapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains and grace be with you. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Oh, yeah. There we are. Good evening, one and all. Lovely to see you. I just a little fleeting thought in my mind. I just no, no, I won't. Well, I just I read our, our dear friend Luke, the Doctor. Thinking, wow, is that a reference to science fiction all the way back then? But you know, maybe not. Let's pray. We're going to need it. Let's pray. <laughs> Get out of my head. Loving Heavenly Father, please be at work in us tonight as we consider your word. Lord, may your spirit move in us and draw us into that which is of you, deeper into knowledge and love of you. Lord, help us to take hold of what you would reveal and let go of everything else. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I apologize for that first one. Because it's been a, it's been an incredible journey through Colossians up to this point, and um, we've had some incredible theology laid before us as we as we've come through the different weeks, and you know in, the, in those early chapters of just explaining who our Lord Jesus is, and subsequent chapters outlining who we are in Him, and then Chris last week sort of masterfully laying out, you know, if all that's true, if that's who He is, and that's who we are in Him then this is how we're to be. This is how we're to live. And then we come to chapter four and I get the rough end of the stick and it's all this long list of people that uh, he's saying, you know, he's passing on messages about, um, which is all incredibly important um, and um, very meaningful. 
uh, all these different people doing incredible things for the Lord. But but I actually want to land and place our focus, if I can, this evening on those verses, verses two to six, that's headed in the NIV further instructions, the bit that, that, that Julie referred to right at the, the, the beginning um, of the service, which talks about an open door, that God may open a door for our message. I want to I go there and what Jesus is asking of us through his word in those, those short verses. I mean, it kind of answers the question or the, the statement that comes right at the end in verse 17, where there's an instruction to Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you've received in the Lord. Well, do you know, if, if this is who the Lord is, if this is who we are in him, if we're following the, the flow of the letter through, if this is how we're to live in the light of that truth, how do we finish the work that we've received in the Lord? Well, that little section in further instructions illuminates that for us. It says, this is how you finish that work. This is how you go about the business that's my business, that's kingdom business, as you live out your lives in, 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 through being in him, through being in this incredible Lord, this is how you live out our lives. And, and I think these, these, these instructions are just quite electric. Um, and the importance of the open door is, is just so, so crucial. Um, I'm, I've told this story time and again here at St. Paul's. I think a number of people will have heard it before. But I remember being a searching 26-year-old man being nudged by the Lord towards faith. In fact, I was fairly convinced that, 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 that for the first time in my life, that this God thing was real, that Jesus was real. And I was nudged by some others who were part of that journey with me, telling me I should go to a church. And off the back of some experiences and being convinced about God being real and working in my life, I went to the biggest and most obvious place that was a church where I lived. I was living in Christchurch at the time. And um, the biggest and most obvious place there was the Priory. I approached that place as a scruffy mess and approached the big church door. I walked around from the car park where I'd parked my moped and I walked round to the front door of the church, um, looking scruffy in my jeans, my leather jacket, my motorcycle helmet under my arm. I hadn't shaved that morning. And on the journey from the car park to the front door of that building, I was sneered at, frowned at, tutted at, and eyes were rolled in my direction. I, I can tangibly remember that experience and, and what I felt like as I came from the car park towards that church door. And it was a big, daunting church door anyway. It's a big old wooden door. And I remember approaching that door and then turning around, and I didn't even enter the building because the door was shut. The, the door was shut even before I got to it. Now, that probably says a lot more about me and the state that I was in at that time than it does about the people that I encountered. Um, they're probably lovely Christian people, but what I saw that day stopped a searcher, a, a lost one, a prodigal, from stepping in through that door. And at the heart of this passage is a desire for an open door. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. And I think if, if we can absorb what Paul's saying around his desire for that open door, the, count, the kind of encounter that I've just described would never happen. And if we absorbed Paul's understanding of our mission and our role as he lays it out in these few short verses here, you know, our, our role, our mission, our task becomes incredibly clear. We must be a church that, along with Paul, longs for an open door an open door. 
for the mystery of Christ to be proclaimed clearly. And there's three lessons in this, these four verses. And the first lesson is about talking to God about people. It's about prayer and being devoted to it. Secondly, it's about talking to people about God, which you come to from verse 5 and 6. And thirdly, it's a strong reminder of the message of the church that is the focus of both of those conversations, the conversation with the Lord in prayer and our, our conversation with outsiders, as, it, as we're told in verse 5. And I want us just to consider those three things in turn. So firstly, you know, we open the door to the kingdom of God if we devote ourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. You see, I would argue that those people en route to that church door that Sunday morning weren't being watchful and thankful. They weren't being watchful for the prodigal returning. They weren't being thankful for a lost one actually bothering to come and step inside their world. They were being the opposite of watchful and thankful. It was a long time ago. You don't know anybody who's there. But Paul, Paul's the great apostle who'd already been halfway around the world, the known world anyway. He preached the gospel. He's planted churches. He's been beaten, stoned and imprisoned and is, you know, still stands as a hero of faith. Yet he still asks these people for help. He began his letter by telling them that he thanked God for them. And he prayed for them. And he closes it by asking them to do the same for him. And it's so encouraging to think that there's always something we can do for the sake of the kingdom of God. And it's the most important thing we can do. It's we can pray. It's a message that needs to be picked up and heard so much by the church today. Because I think we forget it all too quickly. There's always something we can do for the sake of the kingdom of God, and it's to devote ourselves to prayer. It's so important because of what it does. Pray that God will open to us a door for our message. We can talk all we like. We can discuss things in committees forever. We're brilliant at that in the church. But unless God opens the door to people's hearts and lives, we're simply making a useless noise. Prayer is what opens that door. Prayer and nothing else will see someone submit their lives to the Lordship of Christ. There's a mysterious thing that goes on when people pray and the word is announced in the context of that prayer. That's God at work. And he chooses to work through us. And prayer is often our most significant contribution. His prayer opens doors. And this, this prayer, it's not about, you know, the odd arrow prayer that we might fling up here and there in response to something that's going on around us. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. And this is where I feel the sting of Paul's further instructions, right in that first word of verse two, devote yourselves to prayer. That word translated devoted is the word proskaterio. That's the Greek word that's in there. It means to persist obstinately in or being constantly there in. And this is what Paul was demanding. They were to be obstinate in prayer. They should never give up. They were to be constantly there in prayer that the door to the kingdom of God might be opened, that he might proclaim the mystery of Christ clearly as he should. For what? Devoted to prayer for what? For us to make the most of every opportunity, we're told. In verse 5. For us to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders. We need to be praying that. Because week in, week out, I see people coming here. I mean, I don't know, the last, I can't remember the last week there wasn't a new face 
in our church on a Sunday morning. And it breaks my heart when I see that that new face isn't met with and talked to by another, when we're not being watchful, when we're not being wise in the way we act towards outsiders. So we've got to be talking to God about people. We've got to be on our knees, devoted, persisting, persisting obstinately in prayer over this whole idea that there are people who don't yet know Jesus, that there are people who haven't met him, there are people who haven't had their lives changed by him, and there are people that we haven't met, and we don't know what their stance is in relation to Jesus as they walk in through this door, never mind when we walk out through that door and then meet them outside, wherever we go and spend most of our time. But if we devote ourselves to prayer, we come to a place where we'll hear the Lord in relation to that. We'll see prayers being answered in relation to that. And we'll find ourselves staggered at what the Lord is doing through that. We'll find the door opening. The door to people's hearts. And the doors that will see them embraced by their loving Heavenly Father as they're reconciled to him and drawn into his kingdom. So we must be talking to God about people through devoted prayer. But we've also got to be talking to people about God. The two are inseparable. They go hand in hand. And there's a real sense of urgency in what Paul writes here. Make the most of the time, he's saying. Make the most of every opportunity. It's kind of like he's saying, buy it up like it's the January sales. Whatever your favorite thing is that you would go and stand outside a shop for hours for and queue for to go in there so you could buy it and have it because it's the thing that you want. That's the kind of urgency that he's kind of laying out here. Buy it up like it's the January sales. Snap it up in a hurry. Urgency. Be wise in the way we act towards outsiders. Paul wanted these Christians to play an active part in pointing others to Christ when the opportunities, the opportunities that they prayed for, arose be praying for the opportunity then take the opportunity when it comes don't pray for the opportunity then ignore it when it comes which is what we're all very good at pray for the opportunity and then grab it with both hands urgently when it comes and we'll see the kingdom impacted by new life being brought in and these opportunities come in all shapes and sizes depends what you pray for but they're talking to people he's saying was to be wise their conversation gracious in verse six that your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so we've got to be gracious in our conversation showing respect for the other person we've got to be salty in our conversations You know, salt was used for preserving, for healing. It was flavoursome. It wasn't bland and it wasn't harmful. It brought about healing and it was a bit tasty. So our words should be a bit tasty when we're talking to people. You know, we shouldn't, we should allow it to be distinctive like salt is distinctive. We should allow ourselves to be bold in what we say about Jesus. With grace, with gentleness and with respect echoing words of of, of Peter in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, where he talks about giving the reason for the hope that we have, answering everybody with respect. They were to be ready to answer everyone's questions. Again, that echoes Peter. Be prepared to give the reason for the hope that you have. You, You give the reason when you're asked a question. And here, Paul's quite explicit about that. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Answer what? The questions that they're asking you in response to your prayer, and you're taking that opportunity to speak with grace into their lives. They'll ask questions about this Jesus, because he's not like anything else that the world has ever seen. He's different. And we're different because of the way that he's impacted us. That's what it should be. And so our lives generate questions. So that we can give the reason for the hope that we have, that we can answer wisely, making the most of every opportunity, knowing how to answer everyone. 
they were to be ready to answer everyone's questions. If Paul's job was to declare the mystery of Christ, they too must learn to proclaim him in their words. Conversation full of grace, seasoned with salt, in their actions. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Words and actions coming together to speak of the difference that Jesus makes to our lives. This was their work that Paul was calling them to. To be in partnership with him, to be in partnership with God himself, by his spirit, doing this work in the world, to evangelize with gentleness and reverence in the everyday encounter that we have, in the everyday encounter that's generated by our talking to God about people and then talking to people about God. All of that requires us to ask a pretty challenging question. Does your life as a follower of Jesus provoke questions from others? Are you a bit salty? Not in the sort of modern parlance sense of that, because you're a bit salty nowadays. It means you're a bit grumpy with someone, I've learned. But my boys have called me salty on more than one occasion. But salty in the sense that your, your distinctive flavour has been preserved so that people will look at you and see there's a difference to you. People will look at us and see that there's a difference to us because of Jesus, because of what he's done, because of what his spirit is doing. Do our lives as followers of Christ provoke questions from others? Do our lives look like Jesus's life? I was talking to an older gentleman very recently who says he only wants his life to make sense in the light of the gospel. That the only thing that will explain what he does and why is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his goal. That should be every Christian's goal. That our life only makes sense in the light of the gospel. It was an inspiring encounter. He wanted his life to demonstrate that Jesus makes a difference. And the challenge that arises from Paul's instructions here is, is that our aspiration? So we're to pray for an open door. We're to urgently make the most of every opportunity, living pro provocative lifestyles that provoke questions in others about Jesus, that we can then, with a good dulce, dose of salt and grace, give answers to those questions. We talk to God about people. And we talk to people about God. And what do we talk about? Well, we talk about this thing that is the gospel. We have a content. We're not free to invent our own content. We have a content to deliver on behalf of the Lord to the outsiders that we have devoted ourselves to prayer about, that they might hear this thing. And the message of the church that Paul challenges us to hold out, it's not rocket science. It's not complicated. It's that which we have received from the testimony of the apostles recorded here that we carry on our hearts. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul sums it up here as the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ. This baffling, mysterious message that God has somehow become man and in that has reconciled us to himself through the, the life, death, resurrection and ascension of that man. That in him, in this mysterious thing that's happened where Jesus, who is human but is also divine, has rescued us from ourselves and enabled us to enter into eternal life with the Father, a life that begins now and goes on forever. Elsewhere, he calls it Jesus Christ and him crucified, which is absolutely foolishness to everyone who hasn't grasped it. How can you pin your hopes on 
a hero, a rescuer who was nailed to a cross. There's no rescue in that. And they fail to see the rescue that's in that. They fail to see the victory of the cross over all sin, over all evil. And they fail to see the life that the resurrection brings. The resurrection life that Jesus was raised to and he calls us to follow him in. In chapter one of this letter, he describes it as being rescued from the power of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's John 3, 16, where for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's the love of God evident in the life, death, the, just the story that we have to tell, the greatest story ever told. It seems like foolishness to the world, but it's the message we're challenged to devote ourselves to pray about and to proclaim in word and action, as Paul's laid out here. And we trust that God will open doors for that message into the hearts and minds of those that he leads us to. So hear the challenge of Paul here at the end of this letter and devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to this, remembering that that means to persist obstinately in. Persist obstinately in talking to God about people. Laying them before him, saying, Lord, I want this one. And persist obstinately in that. Pray to God over this and then speak to others about God. Telling them who he is and what he has done for them and the love that he has for them. And how transforming that is. That, in the context of that message that we're commanded to carry, that's what's going to make a difference to our church. That's what's going to make a difference to others. That's what's going to grow the kingdom. I just wanted to say tonight, as we close this letter, hear Paul's cry and devote yourselves to this work. Amen.